This week in a conversation, I have the privilege to receive a prolific author, Neil Litterland, joining me from uh, Indiana. Uh, he's going to be talking about his uh, multi-genre literary activities. Interesting video. But before we get into that, I just want to remind everyone about my latest novel, Bittersweet Memories of Last Spring. I really would like for you to take a look at it. And I'm asking everyone the best way to support my literary journey is to purchase yourself a copy. And if you have, you can always uh, uh, use it as a gift to uh, uh, a friend uh, in the holiday season. So please uh, uh, do that. And also, I'm asking you to continue to support uh, the conversation, which is a uh, one of our best literary shows out there on YouTube. Uh, and of course, if you haven't subscribed and you subscribe now, don't forget to click the notification bell. So that way, every time a video is posted, it's going to you as soon as possible. So let's get started. Again, my name is Ardani Sma, and I'm here this evening with a, with a very impressive author. I'm here with Neil Litterland, and I'm um, a prolific writer. So we're going to be talking about his, uh, yeah, impressive works and literature. Uh, to begin with, uh, Neil, welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. So would you please tell the viewers of CSNS Magazine who is Neil Littleland? Absolutely. Um, I've been an author for about a decade now. I've uh, done a lot of short stories. I've done several novels. I've written a lot of RPG fiction. I've just kind of bounced around, uh, done a little bit of every category that anyone will hire me for. Okay, great. So you just said something that so anyone hires you for. So that means you do ghostwriting also, or you do uh, uh, freelancing also? Absolutely. Actually, uh, I started out as a ghostwriter when uh, I was I was fairly new and I wasn't sure how one went about getting an agent, submitting to a publisher or things like that. So I would I would go to I don't know if the uh, if the old boards I went to earlier in my career are still up, but I would I would just scroll through and find people. It's like, hey, we need someone who can get us a romance short story by next week or I want someone to do two chapters of this book and and we'll we'll discuss terms uh, once I've seen some of your work and that was that was how I sort of padded out my resume early on okay great so is that way you begin to realize the potential to become yourself a writer right I did it was it was one of those of the the question being did I want to take the risk and do stuff that I wanted to do? Or did I want to keep, you know, finding clients who had ideas but couldn't put them into words? And it was a bit of a trade-off and I, it's still not all one or all the other, but I do a lot more of my own ideas now than I do other people's these days. Okay, so that's great. And then uh, uh, now let's talk about your series, uh, the Boil Cat series. Mm, yeah, it was the... Um, there's a fun there's a fun story I like to tell about that one of it was um, several years ago there was a, a friend of mine of she wanted to you know do some writing she wanted to to get some of her own stories out there so I suggested that we go and we find uh, some anthologies find out who's currently looking for authors and I found one that was uh, from a cat's view uh, I think it's still available from uh, Robin Praetor was the editor I cannot remember the company's name for the life right. of me. And it was, it was essentially they wanted short stories from a cat's perspective. And after I had, I had helped two of my friends kind of figure out their own ideas, I had an idea of my own. And that was how I wrote Stray Cat Strut, which was a, a short story. And enough people liked that. And I was like, well, I, I suppose I should expand this now. And so it's a it's kind of a you know, film noir-esque mystery series. Uh, and it takes all of the, the usual tropes and figures that we're used to seeing and translates them into street animals in New York City. So you know, instead of the uh, the hard nosed private detective who doesn't want to get involved in everybody's business, is our protagonist Leo, who is an alley cat that lives behind a deli. You know, we have his his friend who's been you know the guy on the wrong side of the law who's kind of left that life behind, but he's still a bruiser when he needs to be. Is his friend Doc, who is like a dog owned by a barista who always works next door, and it's it's just kind of translating those sorts of stories and cases and filling them in with you know various cute and cuddly animals 
and then never taking that edge off of like these are not Disney creatures. These are these are definitely not stories for kids. For anyone who's who's listening to it, thinking, "Oh, that'll be cute. I'll, I'll get it for for my child." Of, I wouldn't recommend doing that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, you just mentioned uh, you still uh, you still do ghost writing too while you you embark upon all these activities. Oh yeah, I had a. Um, uh, some of it's ghost writing. Some of it is just work for hire. Of I'll I'll have folks who. They've decided that my name is known enough in certain communities. They're like, no, we won't want to tell people that you wrote it, but this is what we want you to do for us. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. Or other times they'll just have folks who it's, you know, we need a, we need some stuff to flesh out this world, or we need something that'll get people interested in this property. And just be like, all right, what's what's your fee? I'll I'll get it to you next month. Okay, so uh, uh, for that, I have a question. Can uh... Is is do you know when you do freelancing, mm -hmm. does that impact your on a uh, little where we work? I would say, uh, uh, as far as either what gets priority or uh, as yeah, far yeah, as, exactly. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's paid work goes front of the line every, every time. Of it's a um, unless I'm already on deadline for something, and I'll usually negotiate with with folks about that of if someone is giving me cash in hand, pay me when it's when the story's turned in, that's usually what gets my immediate focus. And then once that's been turned in, once that project is done, I'll turn back to other stuff that has kind of a softer deadline or just a get it done when you can. Okay, so, so I, I understand very well, because you know, I'm an author myself, because I know it, it, it requires time, you know, to to focus. Uh, it's a project, you know. Yeah. It, you have to have your own game plan and all that, and this, and then plus you have to deal with uh, uh, other people who, who 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 depend on on you, you know, to to polish their their own literary works. Right. Do you focus only on fantasy or other type of literary genre? Oh no, I have done. Uh... I think at this point, I like to make the claim that I've done a little bit of everything. Uh, I actually started this leg of my career uh, doing a lot of romance stories because romance publishers were some of the only ones who would look at my lack of recent publishing history and be like, ah, let's see what you can do. And then I've done a lot of horror stories. It's probably the one I've, I've published most for, honestly. And then I've done fantasy. I've done sci-fi. I've done genre blends. Uh, one, of my, one of my first collections uh, that came out it feels like forever ago at this point it was a collection of steampunk short stories back when that was still kind of a new uh, genre that folks were enjoying. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, so that means uh, uh, I understand that the ball cat series is out of print right now. Yes. Yeah, it was so, a, um, uh, is there any plan to we publish them? Or? Absolutely. I, I don't want to name names at the moment, but um. Part of what happened for, for folks who are familiar with the, the recent unfortunate loss of Eric Flint of his company, Ring of Fire Press, uh, had both of both of my hard-boiled cat novels along with um, my sci-fi noir story of Old Soldiers. And so as soon as, you know, there was, there was all sorts of emails that needed to be sent and legal precedent that had to be gone through and everyone had to figure out who owns the rights to what at this point. And so once once I got the rights to my stories back, I started poking a couple of folks that I know. And there's at least one to two people who were like, was like, yeah, I want that. If nobody else wants it, let me let me look at it. I'll get something something drafted up. So I'm I'm waiting to see who ends up with it. Okay. I'm tentatively hopeful it'll be out and for sale again by February, March ish, something oh, like that. But yeah, that's interesting. Yes, because I I know Neil is it's not easy to find uh, uh, traditional publishers. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> as, as an author, so uh, and to find a publisher, period, because that's why so many authors out there they just give up the idea and they just go straight self publishing. Uh, how lucky you were to uh, oh. found. Uh, a publisher yeah, very lucky it was actually a um for anyone who is looking for a publisher who hasn't heard this piece of advice before the the way that i found my way onto that list um i think i was at it was either WindyCon or capricon both are held in in chicago for folks who haven't been to them there's mid-sized sci-fi conventions 
And it was just volunteering to be on panels, talk about stuff, uh, whether it be role-playing games or like, how do you, how do you write rational characters was one I had at the last uh, convention I was at. And I just, I happened to share a table with some folks who were editors for Ring of Fire at the time. And so like when I want to give them my pitch of like, Hey, this is the book that I just finished. I'm kind of working on it. And their reaction was, that sounds great. When can I have it? I said, what? I, I, I thought we were just talking. It's like, no, I want that. Give it to me. I was like, Oh, here. <laughs> Okay. And so it's, it's one of those of sometimes all it takes is literally just being in the right room with the right person, having the right conversation. Okay, great. So uh, have you, because uh, uh, I know every writer, especially good fantasy authors, uh, uh, they, there's a huge community on Twitter out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's huge. Uh, at the beginning of this program, I, I remember I started it uniquely with all fantasy authors and then we you know we spread and with, with the historical fiction writers and all the other time but you know let me ask you something do you think that with all the uh literary genres uh you think fantasy is the most difficult one to write mm, i think fantasy comes with a very unique set of challenges of uh, it was um yeah and that, that's going to depend on you know, of course all the different sub genres of fantasy and whatnot but it's something I found of figuring out what the rules for your particular fantasy are mm -hmm. can can end up being a butterfly effect of even even just something as simple as, you know, like the hard boiled cat stories I was doing. I had people asking, like, so are spiders sentient in this world? And I had to have that hard line of like, no, we're not having insect characters. I don't want to deal with that. But then there were other questions like, you know, what are the mores among these various animal communities? Like, are they are they a one to one comparison with with certain human character categories or or groups of people? Or are they sort of their own thing? What's the culture they've come up with? And you can sort of spiral that out to to any other uh, fantasy setting. Of I was very lucky in that I like New York City already existed. I didn't have to make it up. I can only imagine the nightmare I would have had for myself creating the rest of a world in addition to all of the other nonsense. Okay. Very good. So uh, let me ask you another question here. Uh, because they say that the biggest problem when it comes to, uh, uh, not the biggest one, but it's a very important stage in the writing, which is the world building. You have to build your world before you. Okay. Do you find that also as challenging to find it very challenging it can be it can be very rewarding at times of okay. um like there there are some friends that i have both who just enjoy writing as as an art and some other folks who who are actively authors and publishers and that's their favorite part of it and it is occasionally really frustrating especially if you just have the one good idea and then you have to take all of the different um i suppose ripples in the pond of like okay this thing now exists all right, how does that affect everything else in the world? Mm -hmm. And then it's like it it comes to a point of depending on the scale of your story, you have to ask, well, like this one cool thing I mostly want to do for aesthetics has now led to an overthrow of a government on the other side of the world that I hadn't thought of until just now. And it is it is intense. Um uh, and especially if you think you've gotten it all right, and then you you either get halfway through the story and you realize you overlooked something. Or you get to the end of the story and you've handed it off to your beta readers and they come back to you of like, hey, that was really interesting. What are the rights of undead creatures under the law of this hegemony? Like, I hadn't considered that. Thanks for bringing that up. And so it's 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 a never ending process of just answering all the questions. It's the same story. When I spoke to a historical fiction writer uh, not too long ago. Uh, it's a, the challenge is the, uh, the research that you have to do. Most people don't realize that even if it's literature, if you're going to do historical fiction, you have to, to get your facts, you know, correct. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like there, there's always someone who knows when you mess that up. It was a um, even even relatively simple things. If I had I had some friends of mine uh, when I would write a couple of Westerns, mm -hmm. they, they would come back to me and be like, hey, that was really good, except uh, you either need to change the date or change this particular weapon. <laughs> it hasn't been released for five years until after your story is set. Say, ah, crap. <laughs> That's interesting. OK, so uh, uh, I have a question for you. Do you have any specific writer who has inspired you to become yourself an author? There's, there's several of them. Of uh, it's a, 
something that you know as, as i mentioned like you know the hard-boiled cat series is is very very noir style very that kind of like every man poetry you get in like humphrey bogart movies things like that but that always spoke to me so i suppose when i when i finally got a hold of dashiell hammett when i was when i was much younger and i read through all of his like best collected novels and then i realized who the who the jake and the thin man series was actually about and so like there was a lot of that Mm-hmm. but also um, authors like Stephen King, Clive Barker, or just anyone who can take those ideas of the bizarre and the macabre and explain them in a way that authors like Lovecraft were always just like, no, can't, it's un- indescribable. <laughs> just make it up yourself. I-, I can't be bothered. I'm on deadline. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, I'll, uh, at some point, and whenever I have an author in the conversation, because I know we're human, so we're not simply just superheroes. Uh, so besides writing, Neil, uh, what other hobbies do you have, you know? Oh, there's, I would like to say there are a lot of them, but most of most of what I do for hobbies at this point, I have, I have kind of bolted on to the career as just other stuff that I do. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't make it less fun. Of, uh, you know, in addition to playing many, many tabletop games, I got into that probably i think my freshman year of college which was a lot longer ago than i want to think about right now <laughs> but you know that's that's kind of a weekly activity i do you know, like get friends together we we roll funny shaped dice and, and talk in silly accents of i really enjoy uh audio dramas of weird fact about myself for folks in the audience who don't know me uh, i didn't really listen to as much music growing up i would get those big collections of like audio dramas for kids Mm-hmm. And then when I'd outgrown those, I got like the collected works of the Shadow, the Green Hornet, things like that. And I would just I would just listen to those endlessly. And then I found out as an adult that audiobooks were a whole thing. I could just go mm-hmm. to the library and get as many of them as I wanted. Mm-hmm. So it's it's one of those things of I don't read as many physical books as okay. as I used to, particularly not before I was a student. But you know, that's pretty much every day of I'll just go through entire just um catalogs i suppose of like folks who've done either fan presentations or just like youtube channels that will take like stories that i know or things that i enjoy and they'll get a cast together and they'll do sound effects and it's a lot of fun i've, I've started doing a couple of those myself for some of my shorter works just as a this is a thing I, I like listening to maybe i should do it and then i started doing it and yeah. like, oh this is this is way more involved than i thought it was going to be but well i'm here now and i'm invested <laughs> okay so i'll uh, uh... Let me ask you this now. Uh, is there any particular genre that really uh, uh, that you really love to write? Mm. Horror is always going to be my first love. Of okay. it's it presents so many unique challenges, particularly right. of like you need to convince the reader to stay invested and to open up to you. And then you have to hurt them in a way they don't expect. And it's, okay. it is very difficult to do. And I'm always really proud of myself when I manage it. But you know, like I have, I have never kicked a genre out of bed for an assignment. It's just one of those of if, if I could do anything I wanted and I got to pick, that's probably what I would end up doing. Okay, great. That's interesting. All right. So, uh, I want to expand a little bit on RPG supplement. You know, I know you mean video games, right? Oh no, no. Um, tabletop games are um, they're, I suppose, analog is the best mm-hmm. term for it. Of uh, it's okay. there, there are lots of video games uh, based off of them. Uh, mm-hmm. Dungeons and Dragons is the one most people know, mm-hmm. but it's a. There are like if um, for for folks not familiar of if you you have a video game that is a role playing game you you log in and you have your controller and you make your character and everything is very visual and you you play through what folks have programmed and that's kind of a a computerized version of tabletop games where you have a stack of books that will describe like here's the lore of the world here are the the rules for what characters you can make here's here's all the powers they can have and you'll you'll print out physical sheets that you write all of your statistics into and you'll make notes on character description character history goals things like that and then you get a couple of your friends together you all sit around a table with your dice and then you'll collectively tell a story 
And some of the time you'll just, you'll make your contributions of you know, like, you know, my character says this, or I want to open this door and explore this room. And then if there's a situation where you have kind of a, a conflict where if you were an author, you could decide how it went, but now there's five or six of you involved. So you, you grab your dice and you, you roll them and you add up the numbers. And depending on whether or not your numbers exceed the threshold, that depends on whether or not you succeeded. So it's, it's a much more complicated version. A little bit more the, than that. Yeah. All right. So let me have my last question for you, Neil. Uh, if there is a lesson that you would want to give to anyone who would love to be a multi-genre mm. uh, author, so prolific as you, so what lesson would you give that person? Oh, it is... Oh, I, I got to pick one. Okay. Um... If you want to do multiple genres, uh, the best thing that I can suggest, in addition to just like the very broad of like, make sure you read lots of books because everyone needs to do that. But it's don't just imitate the aesthetics of a genre, whether it's the uh, the cosmic horrors of Lovecraft or like the the linguistic use that you see in like hard boiled detective fiction. Of it's like open up, open up the hood of the genre and really dig down into what makes them work. Of what are the the conflicts that get readers engaged? What are the the central pillars of what these stories are talking about? And once you understand those things more in depth, it allows you to mess with all of the rules in ways that other people might not expect, and it allows you to create more engaging stories that aren't just sort of spray painting a car a different color and hoping that nobody notices really good and with that i'm just gonna say it's been more than a pleasure to have had the opportunity to receive one of the most prolific writers out there neil Litterlane from from indiana okay thank you for having me <laughs>